Welcome everyone. This month we have a great panel talking about the convergence of healthcare and IT. And it is my pleasure to introduce one of our AZ Bio Peers Advisory Board members, Daryl Baker, who is going to be leading the session today. Daryl, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you, Joan. It's great to be with everybody today. Uh, we're really excited about this panel. I, you know, in the uh, biotech community, we talk a lot about, you know, curing cancer and, and doing a lot of high-end things, but there is a great health tech infrastructure here in Arizona, and we have an opportunity today to, to learn from some of the leaders in this uh, health tech sector uh, with a great, great slate of uh, solutions in the world of healthcare. So um, I, my name is Daryl Baker. I'm the CFO of Redirect Health. Uh, and what we do at Redirect Health is we make healthcare uh, work essentially for uh, primarily for small businesses. Uh, we leverage technology and a passion for care to make that happen for our clients and their, their members and families. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the panel. Kent Dix is CEO and founder of Life365. We have Dr. Greg Sanders, who's the founder and CEO of Hybrid Chart, and James Bate, who is CEO of Now Medical. And, and I guess to start our panel, uh, I'll start, Kent, maybe if you could uh, give everybody a, an overview of Life365 and, and tell us what, what you're up to. Sure. Thanks, uh, Daryl. Uh, as Daryl said, my name is Ken Dix. I'm CEO of Light365, and this is my uh, third company started here in Arizona. I'm a native of Arizona. I went to Arizona State University. <clears throat> we built and sold our last healthcare company, to, which was one of the first IoT of healthcare, to Allier Abbott Labs, where I was CEO of the Allier Connect division, connecting populations and HIEs and point-of-care devices. Uh, we left in about 2016 timeframe. We started Life365 uh, to be able to connect to populations uh, remotely uh, to make uh, financial models of care work. So you're now starting to see telehealth companies that are emerging. You're starting to see hospital at home, SNP at home. We need to be connecting people. And that's what Life365 is about, combining services and solutions into a virtual care platform. Great, thanks, Kent. Uh, Greg, I'm gonna pivot over to you. Why don't you tell us about Hybrid Chart? Sure, thanks, Daryl. So, uh, Greg Sanders, I'm a practicing cardiologist. I've been in the Valley since 2002, and uh, half of my brain works as a doctor and the other half works as a software developer. And so I saw a huge void in the market where doctors who are rounding at hospitals were struggling with the workflow, were struggling with how to get their charges back to their billers, basically known as charge capture. And so um, I built hybrid chart years ago, just solved my own pain points. And it's now grown uh, national and every specialty and every practice size. And so part of it was really just making sure that the doctors had a solution that was tailored to their unique workflow. Any of you who obviously all work in healthcare know that the workflow for a doctor is not only um, tedious and different, but the users are also tedious and different. So uh, that's a challenge. And our other major struggle was to make sure that we weren't an awesome solution siloed by ourselves. So interoperability was our other main focus to make sure that we connected with all the other pieces of the puzzle for the workflow. So I'm happy to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Greg. And then lastly, James. Thanks, Daryl. My name is James Bates. I'm the founder and CEO of AdvyNow Medical. AdvyNow Medical was founded in, in 2016, so we've been around for, for a little while. Um, but what we do is help eliminate the overhead of healthcare. So when you go to a doctor, you actually spend 66 cents in administrative activity that the doctor has to do, as well as the clinic itself, in order to get paid and not get sued. So what AdvyNow Medical does is it'll help eliminate that overhead by using artificial intelligence and augmented reality to completely automate the medical visit. Great. Thank you, James. Um, as I said, right, we have a great panel here today with uh, experts in, in the world of health tech. 
And again, as Joan said, we would really like this uh, panel to be interactive with the uh, participants. So we're hopeful that as the discussion uh, carries on, that if you have questions, comments, please insert them into the chat uh, so we can have this be interactive. But I really wanted to kind of start uh, the conversation. Obviously, we've been living through COVID right now for what a year and a half, it seems like it's been going on forever. And, and so much has changed in, in society as a result of uh, COVID. And one of the things that, that I've noticed, and not just in the world of healthcare, right, but in, in just society in general, is that it seems like things have moved more from uh, in-person interaction to more virtual interaction, even the, the fact that we're doing this uh, panel today in a Zoom format, I think speaks to that. Um, and, and so one of the things that, that we think about at Redirect Health is this concept of virtual, what we call virtual first right, versus in-person first. And so I kind of wanted to just throw this out to the panel. Um, how do you view the impact of this concept of virtual first in the world of healthcare? I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to, to James first and then we'll go around the horn on this. Virtual first, what, how does this impact the world of healthcare? Sure. I mean, COVID ha was a major impact on the healthcare system, um, essentially because it forced doctors and practices to actually adopt technology. Um, Pre-COVID, there was a lot of conversation about how technology is going to change healthcare, and and it was always a push and and pull between people's wants to do it and the fear of the unknown. When COVID came around, it forced it. And this enables a fundamental change in the way people engage with their providers. And it has taken away a lot of the fear about from providers of engaging with tele type of visits, whether that be asynchronous visits, which means you text message back and forth with your doctor, or you have a video call or just a telephone call. Happy Now Medical actually has a fundamental premise where care starts at home. And the AI will actually do an interview with the patient and determine where the most appropriate point of care is. And if you care, compare that to a traditional visit where you walk into the doctor's office, you stand, you fill out all the paperwork, you meet a physician, the physician will then create a standard of care for you after you get there. It is a fundamental change and it looks like something that, that is here to stay. Great, thanks James. Ken, any thoughts you have on this concept of virtual first? Well, James, James is right. Um, you know, COVID did uh, severely change how we think. You know, I, I go through and call it the new normal. Um, we're not going to go back to the way we were. Um, we are going to, in my viewpoint, I think that what COVID did is just accelerate the track we're already on, right? Whether we were getting food delivery at home, whether we're getting autonomous cars, you know, whether we were getting care remotely, it just accelerated overnight, you know, uh, what we're going to do. So, you know, telehealth had a really poor adoption prior to COVID. It was like probably at 10 to 12 percent, maybe 10 percent. It went to 70 percent overnight because it's the only way you could see your doctor. It went down to about 40 percent. But I know sitting behind my computer now, this is where I want to see my doctor. Right, it's just ludicrous for me to go um, into the into the doctor to get an exam, back to the doctor to get tests, back to the doctor to get my test results. I want to do, you know, I want to do most of it behind the computer here if I can, which means from a consumer perspective, we need to create the digital front door. We need to create the digital front door where we create a platform of health services that walk into the home. So whether that's through a smart TV or that's through a smartphone or that's through an IOT device you know, or that's through a wearable device that's out there, we need to be connected and we need to provide services that are complementary services when we're walking through the digital front door. One last thing I'll say really quickly is, you know, the big thing I see in 2021 and 2022, probably going into 2022 going forward is it's all going to be consumer-directed healthcare. That's who's making the decisions. We're getting ready to put these massive platforms together to embrace consumers. And it's all about personalization. It's going to be, I don't want to walk through the digital front door to Ken Dix and just take care 
of his cardiology problem or just take care of his diabetes. I've got to know Ken Dix to know maybe he has a sleep apnea issue. Maybe he has an obesity issue. Maybe he has a diabetes issue. And I don't want three different companies trying to take care of that. I want to holistically be taken care of by one company. Great. Thanks, Ken. And then, Greg, what do you, do you have any thoughts on this uh, virtual first? Sure. Uh, no, I appreciate the consumer side. So I live the physician side. So March of 2020, we in our practice sort of had a mini panic attack of what are we going to do here? Uh, we were not using telehealth at all. And then suddenly we were on uh, telehealth, um, at least briefly. It didn't last very long for us. Uh, there are a few issues. Um, I think first was sort of the heterogeneity of which platform to use. So we scrambled to try to find some reasonable to use telehealth solutions. Um, and, and some providers picked one and some providers picked another and then our EHR tried to push one. So that was the first problem. Uh, the second problem was um, sort of just the, the natural ability for someone who's 80 to get onto telehealth without a lot of instruction. So we were devoting a lot of resources and staff to call patients beforehand to say, here's how you log in and walk them through a mock version of it. You know, it was new for everybody, but that was a huge stumbling block. And then I think the real reality is that telehealth can work well in certain settings and certain specialties. I would say by July or August of 2020, most of our patients did not want a telehealth visit. They wanted to come in and the doctors, so I think certain specialties, you have a sore throat, you put your throat up against the camera and say, hey, what do you think this is? Here, let me write you a script. Or Kent, to your point, you know, you say, hey, I've already been to see you, give me my test results over telemedicine. Totally makes sense. But I got patients in heart failure. I'm not gonna figure heart failure over a camera. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say point the camera at your feet and how am I gonna listen to your lungs? So there's some, there's some real world obstacles to replacing medical care with a virtual version of it. I do think there's a role for it. Like everything else, there's, there's, if you utilize the technology in the right places, we can definitely move the needle on this, but to assume that we're not gonna go in to see a doctor anymore, obviously, I don't think anyone's assuming that, but that's not gonna work uh, very well. Craig, I was gonna, I hope it's okay, Daryl, just to chime yes. in, but um, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things I see occurring with the telehealth companies you know, they are, I think, going through and not replacing the GPs that are out there, but they're giving more options to GPs, uh, sure. to consumers using a GP. I don't think people are going to give up their specialists. I just don't. I'm not going to give up my cardiologist, you know, from that standpoint. Um, I picked one. I'm working well with them. But from a, my flu and sniffle point of view, you know, calling that 1-800 number and getting you know, a Z pack or whatever I need at the time to be able to do that. I'm, I'm probably open to do that instead. Yeah. And, you know, pediatrics, I think is the great example of where telehealth can really help. You know, it's two in the morning, your baby's crying, you know, you're not going to be interviewing the baby. Uh, so as a provider, if, if you have a teledoc or some sort of solution where your insurance company is giving you a telehealth solution and uh, it's not your actual doctor, but at two in the morning, you've got someone on the screen to walk, you know, hear what the problem is and give you a reasonable solution. That's an alternative uh, to what are your other options? Uh, at so this one, point. Yeah, go ahead. One of the biggest problems people have is they don't know when telehealth is appropriate and when it's not. And, and this is fundamental across the board. It doesn't matter if it's speciality or, or, or if it's primary. Ultimately, if the doctor needs to do a physical exam on the patient, if they need to touch the patient, or if they need to do measurements that are not available in the home or in a, in a place where they can send them to, obviously telehealth is not appropriate. And, and that's, that's true for, for any type of, of specialty or primary care. So what, what is really required is, is for a triage system to be able to help the patient determine the, what Daryl was talking about was where you have virtual first. And if the patient's not going to know, right, am I going to need a chest exam? Am I going to need some type of palpation on, on my abdomen? I, again, there's a lot of things the patient's not going to know is required. And telehealth companies, you know, we can abuse Teladoc here for a little bit. 
they're, they're doing telegas, right? They're not, they're not doing medicine a lot of times. And so what, what, we, what we have done, and, and a shameless plug here for AbbVie now, it, it is really the AI triage up front. And this, this is appropriate, I think, for cardiology, and it is used by cardiologists, um, to do actually a triage of the patient up front to determine whether a, a televisit is appropriate or not. And it, it is dependent on the symptomology the patient has. It's dependent on the illness predictions as well as, as objective measurements, labs, or physical I examination that is required. And as long as, as that is first, then the guesswork that patients have to put into it goes away. As soon as you ask a patient to determine their level of care, they're going to default to the highest level of care. And they end up at the ED. They end up, you know, somewhere where they shouldn't. It ends up increasing costs for all of us. So that's, that's really when Daryl said virtual first, that's, that's how we, I interpret it and, and what I think the future really is. Yeah. You know, James, thanks for, uh, pointing that out, you know, I, again, this is a concept I think it is going to apply universally through so many aspects of life coming out of COVID. Um, you know, and we're hearing a lot of talk right now about, you know, return to the workplace, right? We've had big companies that have sent their workforces remote, and now they're starting to say, hey, we need you to come back. And what we hear is um, a lot of this kind of hybrid world that, that we're gonna evolve into. It's gonna be a combination of in-person and virtual. And I, I think the key is, right, to, is to, for the, the healthcare system is to figure out what is the right balance of, of virtual versus in-person. Because in-person is never going to go away, nor should it. Um, but, but to the point, I, I believe that there's a real opportunity for virtual first, right, and kind of in the triage, phase, as you point out, James, uh, to, to really have an impact, significant impact on, on the system. Um, uh, let, Daryl, let me make a few comments before you yeah. move on. Um, so the, you know, I think we're focused mostly on the outpatient experience right now, which, uh, which is a big part of it. Uh, the other place where I saw COVID change how we do things um, was actually doing telemedicine visits in the hospital. So believe it or not, we've got a patient that's in the ICU, they're COVID positive, the Providers did not want to enter the room and expose themselves. And now for the first time, we're actually doing telemedicine from 40 feet away. Um, and it was an interesting experience to watch, um, you know, how we as healthcare providers had to adapt to the, inf the unknown at the time, um, infectious disease pandemic that we just didn't understand. Is our PPE going to work? Um, and we saw, I personally saw, nurses and ICU docs getting sick um, and some of them being admitted themselves to the ICU. So it was kind of a scary time. I think that's, that's kind of died down a little bit, but I think it kind of opened the door for us to start thinking about where else could this be utilized on the inpatient side, whether it be in a nursing home, whether it be in a skilled nursing facility. It, it kind of raised everyone's eyebrows to say, huh, Maybe this is something we can, obviously not in the throes of a pandemic, but this is something we can utilize. Yeah, excellent. So with that, Greg, I wanna pivot right back to you with my next question, which sure. is um, in your view, what are some of the greatest forces that would be potentially inhibiting broader adoption of technology in healthcare? Um, so, so doctors themselves tend to be a very interesting group of people. And most, most people who are in industry look at healthcare as being decades behind other industries. And part of the reason is, uh, sort of a fear of change. So there are, um, there are inherent, uh, fears for that their workflow is going to be disrupted that people are, are telling them what to do and they, the solutions they're providing historically have not, not been good. They've, they have missed the mark. So I think there's this skepticism that underlies the entire uh, process. Then there's the issue that you, there is not one boss. So if you go to other industries, you're gonna see that there's a lot of different, uh, well, there's, there's sort of a, a pyramid system of, of decision makers at the top. 
Here you've got doctors who are professionals who say, I'm going to mandate my own domain. But then you have healthcare administrators and you have EHRs and it's a big kind of mess. So I think COVID, I'm back to COVID for a second, did kind of get people thinking, I need to clean up my processes. My processes are old. They're, a lot of them are paper-based. Um, a lot of them are disjointed. And so it did open the door to let people do that. I think if the industry as a whole offer some solutions that really mirror the doctor's workflow, and if the industry as a whole can connect the dots appropriately so that the systems talk to each other, then I think there's a, a good chance that physicians will start to adopt the new changes. But I think if industry can't produce the right solutions, doctors are going to continue to kick the can forward and say, look, uh, I'm fine. Come to me when you've got something good. Yeah, I, I think uh, to that point, Greg, it, you said something about, right, historically, there have been a lot of solutions offered, right, that haven't necessarily delivered on, on the promise. So, so I can see how physicians as a whole might be skeptical a little bit regarding some of this technology. Um, can you give us some, and give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about hybrid chart, but tell us about how your solution makes life easier for that provider. Sure, um, you know, the, 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 um, in the office, you've got an ER that tends to organize your processes for you. Um, I think uh, most doctors have adopted an EHR at this point. When you go out into the hospital, there's some big problems. You've got a workforce now out in the field that needs to connect back and it gets to be very complicated. So on one level, you've got just resource management, who's doing what, you're rounding at multiple hospitals, the patients are moving, and so you need a lot of staff to try to coordinate this, or you need a lot of doctors communicating with each other. It's a very inefficient process. It takes up a lot of time. The doctors can be spending doing patient care, right? And they, right now, they probably only do 30% of their time patient care. 70% is organizational or clerical work. Uh, the other issue is just a practical billing problem. So the charges that are being generated and the work being generated in the hospital needs to find its way back to the billers. Billers do not work in the hospital. They either work in your office or they're remote uh, or they're you know, a third party somewhere. And so getting all of that information back to the billers is a huge clunky process, which is fraught with errors and opportunities to leak, mischarges, charges, and reduce your revenue. So what we did with Hybrid Chart was we gave them a real world solution that really mirrored their workflow and sped them up instead of slowing them down. Now, part of that is because I, as the practicing physician, was living and breathing the problem every day. And so it's not like I handed this to a bunch of developers and said, you know, good luck, let me know what you come up with. So I think when it gets into a doctor's hands, they feel like this actually solves my problem. Um, and I think that to answer your question, that's gonna be the main key. The, the first two questions we kind of get is, is this gonna understand my world? And the answer once it's in their hands very quickly is, wow, yes, finally. Uh, and the second is, is this gonna talk to the rest of my stuff? So not being able to connect to the EHR if someone has to start typing, well, that's a problem. Uh, not being able to get a data feed from the hospital so patient information populates into the system automatically, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, so connecting all the pieces is, uh, and giving them a workflow solution that works, I think that's the secret formula. One of the problems you're gonna see, so your first question was, what are the obstacles? So the biggest obstacle is getting everybody willing to play. So we go in and we've got a hospital that doesn't wanna give us a data feed. Well, now we've got a, you know, one piece of the puzzle that's broken. And so there's been this traditional resistance to sharing data, some of its security concerns, but, but that, that's been the culture of not sharing data um, through healthcare, and that's a big part of the problem. Great. Ken, any thoughts you have in terms of uh, obstacles that you see to uh, adoption, broader adoption of technology in healthcare? Yeah, I think we've done an okay job, you know, putting CPT codes out there for reimbursement and trying to get to those options, um, you know, Op, you know, obstacles that are out there. <clears throat> We've extended, you know, uh, some of those uh, CPT codes and 
and waivers during the PHE, the uh, public health emergency, and a lot of those are probably going to stay in place. Uh, but the interesting part of it is, you know, we don't go really after physician practices because we believe physicians and no, you know, no offense to physicians that are on the video or the call is I think are the last adopters of the technology that we're putting out there. Uh, they're busy. Uh, they were forced to get telehealth up and running uh, and uh, they just don't need any more data uh, in their cycle uh, to be able to do that, if, you know. Uh, so uh, I think we have to look at the underlying uh, issue that's really occurring here. And that's fundamentally the markets are changing in healthcare. You're seeing these trillion dollar channels that are emerging. You started seeing them years ago with Walmart getting in the business and CVS getting in the business and Walgreens was already in the business, but getting deeper um, and everybody else threatening to get in the business and the channel, but they really didn't know what they're getting in the business to do. But now you're seeing Teladoc and Livongo, you're seeing Amazon and Transparent, you're seeing Humana and Eel, you know, Cigna and MD Live, you know, and uh, United Healthcare and Vivify, American Well. You're seeing create these channels and the channels are very specifically uh, devoted to create, uh, get closer to the patient and create out and cut out the middleman. So if I was a provider, I'd be a little bit concerned about these telehealth you know, channels coming into my community, cherry picking off the best patients, leaving them with the patients that may pay or not pay, right, in their health system. They've got to actually go out and start building channels outside the health systems to get patients broader outside the local community instead of staying in that community itself because they're not going to win. People are, are going through and creating the pay vider, you know, scenarios in those channels right now and they're not gonna share patients between them. But the end of those channels are connecting into the home and connecting into the consumer. So Teladoc right now is doing episodic care, you know, uh, but they need to do chronic care. And the only way you're gonna do chronic care is to be able to get data on a regular basis. Our mission at Life365 is to make that last mile connection to be able to get data because analytic and AI systems are no good at all unless they have data right from that and near real time data as well. AI needs a lot of data, right, to be able to do it. So whether you wanna see the doctor remotely, when it's even in the office, you've gotta be able to have that data near real time that's relevant and personalized to that individual to be able to make some very informed decisions about them as well. So I think, you know, you're gonna see a lot of things change. The, the interesting thing from my perspective is there's two forces that are, that are really fighting against each other right now. You've got, you know, the payers and lining with the telehealth companies that are going to create their own pay provider scenario and try to get rid of the health systems that they know it right now. I mean, look at Transparent. Transparent went out and bought 300 surgery centers just to be able to go through and do surgery and then send the patient home and they don't go in the hospital. But, you know, they're missing all the services after the surgery. I mean, who's going to take care of them in the home? You know, how are they going to get monitored? If you press the button, is the nurse coming down the hallway to see you? Or you get food, right, as well. Who is addressing that issue? And that's what Life 365 is about. It's about not only connecting that last mile so you can get the same services, hospital at home, you know, in your home itself to be able to connect the platform, not only for the payers and for the telehealth companies, but the other forces are the, the healthcare systems that now want to compete and become pay providers themselves, the big ones, Tenant, you know, Ascension, you know, HCA, they're all going to become pay providers like Kaiser, right, that's out there. And they're all going to need to be closer to their patients to be able to do it. And that's where we're connecting. We're a very simple model. Where we're making that last connection to be able to give data, to be able to drive value for our partners. And so, I mean, it's perfect. It, I, my next question was going to be, what is the role of data in all of this? Um, and Obviously, it's key. Greg pointed out this needing to kind of connect the dots. And if you think about, right, the, the healthcare system, right, there are so many platforms, so many um, places where data is being accumulated. Um, how do we connect the dots? So, Daryl, let me... Yeah, James, yeah. Yeah, yeah let, me, let me just add a... It, it, I'll address that question, but let me also yeah. add a, another comment. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the big challenges that we have moving forward, um, the concept of 
in health where doctors are being paid or, or companies are being paid to keep patients healthy rather than treat them when they're sick, right? And, and ultimately the goal is keeping those patients healthy. So when you start talking about what role is data gonna play, when you start looking at um, systems like Medicare Advantage, which is probably the largest system of population health deployed in, in the world today, um, it's, it's all about the data, but it's not about the data of, hey, I'm gonna treat you. It's let me know everything about you. And this is where patients and primary care physicians are really being overburdened by the data collection to the point where the primary care office has become a data collection center rather than a patient treatment center. Mm -hmm. And, and so what, what the role of technology and the role of, of all of the companies that, that are basically on the call today is, is really how can we efficiently collect the data, categorize the data and make sure a provider can review the data efficiently because ultimately the data is swamping out everybody. And, and so from, from that perspective, I do believe that is the role of artificial intelligence. A, a lot of people use AI as a big data AI where we're gonna root out you know, where the illnesses come from. The reality is, is that we, there's enough research out there that, that we know the telltale signs of, of most illnesses. The problem is actually getting the data in a way such that it can be evaluated and, and action can be taken. So the role of artificial intelligence is actually choosing which questions to ask the patient, choosing which measurements or labs to order, such that we have the results that can be utilized for that patient. Great. So again, my question, how do we effectively connect the dots? We, we got data everywhere. It's everywhere, it's, it's pervasive, right? In all aspects of our lives, but how do we pull these various sources of data? And, and I'll put myself in the, uh, you know, I'm just the patient, right? I, I get seen by this specialist for this issue. I have another specialist for another issue. Each of them has their own uh, electronic health records. I've got multiple providers, for, you know, ordering labs and, and doing all of these things for me. But it, from a patient perspective, it feels so disjointed, and, and I'm not confident that, um, that all of these uh, healthcare providers who are helping me as a patient necessarily have access to, to all the data that would be potentially useful for them. So yeah. systemically, is there, is there an answer, or is this just something that is never going to have a solution? Daryl, it's interesting. You know, I love it when I go to my doctor and they ask me for my data and my numbers. Like, you know, they'll go through and say, what was your A1C? What was your cholesterol? They should already know that, right? They should already be able to go through the electronic health record and know from my visit with my GP what my lab numbers were or that I went to SnorQuest or LabCorp, right, to be able to get it. So, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things uh, from this is that you know, the obvious, you know, elephant in the room is that, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, uh, we are integrating solutions into the clinical workflow, you know, so a doctor is working from one place. Uh, there has to be integration out to multiple sources about Ken Dix, where the data is and comes in. You know, to James' point, you know, that data has to be analyzed and organized and made smarter for the doctor, you know, from that perspective as well. But we have to work from that clinical flow. As a, as, a, as a company that's in healthcare, if you show up to you know, a doctor's office and offer them another system outside their EHR, you are dead, right? Um, so you're dead. So you wanna be able to go through uh, and integrate to the clinical workflow to be able to have orders. I mean, that's why we're interfaced to a company called Zelf. You know, Zelf is you know, going across the major health systems they go through and you uh, organize the digital health solutions in, on inside the the, um, the health systems themselves, and then the orders are put in by the doctors inside you know inside Zelf uh, to be able to go out to the vendors and deploy it logistically, deploy it, and then have the data come back in to the electronic health record. That that loop has to occur. Are we fully integrated as far as electronic health? Hell no, right? We're not. Um, you know, we're not sharing data by design or otherwise. You know, from that perspective. So, 
you know, a lot of times that really impedes, you know, scalability, right, from that standpoint. But we have to continue to try to, um, to integrate into the clinical workflow and give one place where that data is stored. Now, one last comment on data. I mean, data is just not medical data about Ken Dix. Data is, you know, consumer data. Data is economic data, social determinants of health data. You know, there's a lot of different things that, you know, need to be taken in to really understand how Ken Dix or a cohort like Ken Dix acts, right? You may be, you know, a 60 year old white male in Scottsdale, Arizona, but if you don't have, if you have food insecurity, you're different than another 60 year old white male in Scottsdale, Arizona, right, that's out there. And your care may be at jeopardy because you're not going to take your medication maybe, you're not gonna adhere to the uh, doctor's, you know, care because you're thinking about food or your needs, right, as well. So data is just not about predicting, you know, your medical side of the equation. It's about everything around you coming in as an input. Yeah, I agree with Ken. Uh, Kent, um, you know, the, I like the concept of smart data. So I, I'd love to see AI and other systems fix this problem, but let's just look at the reality. I'm sitting in my office, a patient of mine had labs drawn at SonoraQuest, sorry, SonoraQuest, and it's not integrating into my EHR, which by the way is Epic. Okay, so if you can't get it into Epic, then we got big problems here, right? Uh, the other concept that people um, sometimes, and I'm not sure if AI can fix this, I'm not sure if a, a third party loop can fix this, is I look at the average hospitalization. So I have a patient that comes to see me in the office, they just got discharged from the hospital. I don't think people appreciate the mountain of data that is generated from that one four day hospitalization. It's enormous. Just sifting through it. Now, by the way, 97% of it is useless. I don't care what time they were administered their Tylenol, okay? So there's mountains of data that me as the provider has to sift through, which takes up enormous time. And so being able to connect all the dots is one thing, but being able to filter down the data into readable, digestible bytes. But the problem with that is you have to know it's relevant. And so um, I'm not sure how to get to that state. I've, seen, I've worked with a, uh, HIEs as well in Arizona, and they do a decent job of trying to give me the discharge summary and the, some sort of clinical summary that pieces together the discharge meds and a little narrative of what happened. But, but it's a big challenge to filter through this mountain of data. God forbid they were in the ICU for a week. I mean, boy, it's, it's a huge undertaking. James, any thoughts on uh, what Greg is saying about sifting through massive amounts of data? Sure. Uh, um, the, the interesting thing is when that data is inside the EHR, it, it's actually categorized a little bit better than when it's dumped into one of the HIEs. And what you get out of the HIE is a CCDA or, or basically a, a brain dump of everything related to that patient. So it, it's a disaster to go through. Um, there are programs that can go through and, and pull specific parts of the CCDA, but ultimately it's, it, it's a terrible interface. Um, what Adenal Medical does is we, we have integrations with the major EMR vendors where we are actually going and pulling specific pieces of data directly from the EMR. It's not in the old HL7 format, which is what CCDA is and what I was referring to previously and, and what you get from the HIEs. It's actually discrete data. And when you have discrete data, then you can actually pull out what's important from, from the data record. Um, that being said, there's still hard stuff. If you're reading through provider notes, um, one provider is going to use different terminology than another provider and uh, lots of misspellings and lots of other things that, that kind of make it challenging. Um, but ultimately, you can pull what meds the patient's taking, what codes have been assigned from, you know, a procedure code or whether it's a diagnosis code to be able to collect the, the the priority things from that record and you and the AI can utilize them and actually helping to decide what, what care plan the patient has next, what labs they need, what measurements or images they need, or, or what questions should be asked to help give the provider a boost and help reduce that provider burden. 
so much data. So we actually have a question from uh, one of the participants. Um, the question is for the data, can the panel comment on the security slash regulatory requirements for the data transfer as well as cleaning data cleaning and unifying? And he says, I assume data can be of all format accuracy from various stakeholders in the ecosystem. So again, I think security and protocols around data transfer, any, any thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll comment, Daryl. Um, well, ultimately, medical data has to be, have the same level of security as your bank does for your money. Um, if, if you're going to treat that the same, then you're not gonna have really any issues with security. So full encryption, um, anytime you're integrated with an EHR, you actually do have um, access to that EHR, which means your security is their security, which is kind of why it, they, they go through the level of qualification that they do in order to do the integrations. Um, when, when you start talking about data unifying, and, and this is where AdbiNow and, and you know, when we're working with Epic or, or a lot of these EMRs end up having a lot of problems, the, the record in the EMR is actually owned by the doctor. And the, that is, the doctor is legally liable for that record to be accurate. So whenever you have a, a different system writing into that patient record, there has to be a record of who actually wrote it in there to help limit liabilities that end up being on the doctor. So from an Abbey Now standpoint, everything we write in there is, is written in as a scribe. And then the provider can come in and click a button and accept it just as they would if they had a human scribe going in and documenting that information directly. So, so it, the unifying piece is very tough because ultimately the, the provider or the doctor needs to be the one to make that decision of is it okay in the patient record or not. Preparing it and allowing a very simple way of approval, that's, that's what other systems like, like Advy now do. Mm -hmm. Daryl, I was, I was, I was going to say really quickly on, on the data part of it. What I love is when, you know, you're mentoring startup companies, they're getting into healthcare and they're saying, we don't care, you know, about the underlying model. We're going to go out and sell the data because the data is more important out there. And, you know, that is just a fundamental, you know, issue, a fundamental problem that people think they're going to go contract with United Healthcare and they're going to go sell their data out to somebody else that's out there. Um, so that's just not going to happen. Anybody that's trying to start their healthcare company. But the other part of it, you can go through and take insights. Insights are very, very valuable, right? When data is passing through de-identified data that you learn, the system gets smarter. It learns as it passes through your system uh, to be able to get insights so you can actually process the data better uh, and more efficiently in the future uh, through those insights. And we contractually uh, put you know clauses in our contract or MSAs to be able to to provide those insights to make our systems better, and we protect the data obviously as well in HIPAA compliant environments. Yeah, I mean again back to the the whole cybersecurity element of this, and I think we're seeing this issue in broad society, right? Not just with respect to healthcare, but uh, cyber threats are pervasive now in our world, and I think the more that we've gone remote slash virtual has only served to increase the level of cyber risk, right? So, you know, I think uh, to the, the point of this question, how, what are some mechanisms that can be put in place to help ensure that, that our health data, to, you know, to James' point, it's like financial data. We don't want our financial data compromised. We certainly don't want our health data compromised. How can the system ensure that, uh, that, the, that the, the risk of cyber uh, attack is minimized regarding it transfer? It has, it has to be traded exactly the same way, Daryl, right, yeah. as financial data. It does. I mean, you have to have the right environment, security, protocols, you know, contracts, you know, uh, the procedures in place to be able to protect it uh, from that. So, you know, abstinence is a big uh, part of, you know, keeping data away from people as well and keeping people only as a need to know and a need to better access as well. It's all about your quality system. It's all about your security system and implementing the proper procedures in place, just like you would if you were running a bank, right, as well. 
Yeah, I'm going to comment too. I, I think that part of it is good processes and encryption. Part of it is uh, for sure, Kent, I agree, um, you know, limiting who has access to data. But the, the reality is that there are hackers out there that have gotten into some big places. So I think number one, you got to make sure if you're a startup or if you're in healthcare that you're not skimping on this part of the conversation. Um, and so you have to invest in professionals, oftentimes third parties, to make sure that you really are HIPAA compliant. And it's not like the HIPAA compliance checklist is like five things. And, and it, oh, you're, oh yeah, I did all five of those complicated process. Um, we actually got certified to be HIPAA compliant, which puts you through a third party inspection uh, to make sure that you really are doing things properly. Um, I've seen with the growth of the bigger platforms like Azure and, and uh, Amazon, that you, when you go onto one of those platforms before it, it kind of was looked at as a cop out, like, oh, you don't even know how to run your own servers. You're going up into the cloud. The reality I think now is that you get so much security built in to those types of environments because they can afford it on a large scale that I think it's probably the right thing to do. Um, and then you can focus more on your own little environment. So I think of it sort of like being in a, in, a, in a very, very strong castle, but now you're responsible for your own room in the castle uh, to make sure that that's where you're putting your money and that's where you're putting your focus. And that's, that's what allows us to be able, going into those type of environments, whether it's Azure or it's AWS, allows us to keep on stepping up our security levels too, whether it's going to SOC 2 or it's going to high trust which is the yeah. highest level that's out there. Those are the level of securities that we continue to put in place yep. to protect our clients. Great. Uh, another question from a participant, looking to the future, what are the panel members thoughts on the digital twins project and how it, I think, applies to the theme of today's panel? Now, I'm not familiar with the digital twins project, uh, so I, I, I'm going to throw that out there as, a, as an ignorant uh, moderator here. Uh, I, I looked it up briefly from that. Ben uh, brought this up, you know, and I, he's very, uh, you know, forward thinking. Um, you know, the digital twin side of it that I'm getting, and Ben, I'm probably getting it wrong, you know, is almost like second life, you know, from that standpoint and going through and creating your digital twin, your optimal person you know, from the data, you know, that's being uh, brought in about you as well. Um, that's the way I kind of interpret it. You know, if somebody else has got another interpretation, you know, um, feel free to chime in. Uh, but I don't know a lot about it. But, you know, I know personally myself, I will look at where I want to go biometric wise when I start seeing my lab results coming in. Uh, and I know I want to get to a lower A1C or I want to get to a lower, you know, weight or a lower you know, cholesterol level that's out there, that's creating, I, in my viewpoint, my digital twin, which I am actually gravitating towards and trying to move towards and shooting towards to get there. Interesting. Greg or James, oh, any thoughts? On yeah, that? I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what digital twin project is referring to, but I know what a digital twin is. And ultimately, as we're engaging in population health and the goal of physicians or healthcare providers is to help keep patients healthy and not really treat them when they're sick. Well, do both, of course, but the, the goal is to keep them out of the hospital. Then you need to have a digital representation of that patient. And that is what usually a digital twin is referring to is a digital representation of an object. And so you're looking at a digital reputation representation of that patient that represents their lifestyle. It represents their activity. It represent, you know, all of those different things, whether it's labs, measurements, you know, habits, eating, eating trends, all of those things about the patient to help create a model that you can help work with the patient to keep them healthy. Um, so happy to know whoever asked that question yeah. if, if we're close or not. Yeah. You know, Daryl, it's kind of interesting, you know, years ago when we were doing our first company, we were working with Texas Instruments on Second Life, you know, and it was almost like that. We're going out and picking a persona of what you want to be. You could be a 300 pound person sitting on the edge of a bed, right? You know, uh, but 
your persona you pick is, you know, 150 pound person or 180 pound person that's very active and gregarious. And that's psychologically, that's where you kind of want to move to, right? Is that right. persona that's out there as well. One of the things that we've kind of taken into account, it's in the deeper, you know, thinking of stuff, although we're just really a data and patient engagement company, is really looking at root cause, right? And I always take myself, you know, and put myself and I'm, I'm open, you know, uh, to, to whatever that's out there. I look at and say, listen, I've had cardiology issues, you know, maybe a chest pain here and there, you know, a startup can be stressful from time to time, right? Um, and then you look and see what's causing the chest issue and you're treating the chest pain. But then, you know, you know, the doctor's saying I have sleep apnea from that. And then sleep apnea, what is that caused from? Sleep apnea could be caused from, you know, obesity from that. And along the way, you're being treating every single one of those, right, from that, instead of going to the root cause, right, from that. And I think that's what's important about data and personas and everything else with it as well, is get back to that root cause. Stop treating just the A1C, stop treating just the sleep apnea, stop treating just the cholesterol, get back to what the root cause is and eliminate it. Me personally, I've lost 40 pounds over the last probably four months. Um, and it's because, and all those other symptoms went away right from it. And it's, it's proven out to be effective. And that's what I wanna bring back into our business as well, is trying to get back to that root cause. And it comes down to getting the data and figuring out where the, the place you need to start at is. Yeah, Ken, and you look great, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, this last, I think we're uh, getting close to time, but uh, one last question from a participant. Any thoughts on a hybrid approach, such as a national health or data, but let the private sector be the healthcare providers? Greg, I, I'll, I'll pivot over to you. Any thoughts on, on this concept? Well, listen, I think there are some situations where having a centralized database makes a lot of sense. And it's not always necessarily the clinical data. For instance, patients come into my office and they have to register. And I, all of you out there have probably registered for a doctor. They hand you a clipboard, they hand you a pen, and you sit there filling out the same information. Over yeah, stop, and over again. stop, stop doing that. And we don't want to do that we anymore. Can't. We can't. <laughs> yeah. Medicare mandates that you have to do it. Um, um, and, and so there's a lot of regulations in place. But the, the reality is, so much time and resources is spent collecting just demographic and financial uh, data for, uh, you know, if you go to the hospital and then from the hospital, you go, go to the three specialists, you're filling out the same information and, you know, a lot of times. So this to me is a great opportunity where the patient can make sure that in one place that it's up to date. So they change their insurance, they log in, or even the insurance companies have access to it and can update the data. And now you've got a centralized repository of demographic data that everyone can utilize. That's a good example. When you expand this out to clinical information, that becomes to me a massive security issue. So if I'm a hacker and I know that I can go to one place to get the record of every single human being in North America, wow, that's, you better build Fort Knox around that thing. Um, and then, and then the, you know, I'm a big believer in, in humanity and the goodness of humanity, but there are people who are going to try to capitalize on this data because you've got it all in one place. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to overcome that as a society because I think it's gonna be important to get back to the digital twin question. You know, the, the real point of that is that med medicine is so complex. There's so many interlocking parts that affect each other. Sometimes it's, it, it, you know, you, you fix one thing and then four other things break. And so uh, having a model where you can throw things at it and say, okay, well, what happens to that living thing? That's important. So a centralized database of clinical data, I think gives you that opportunity. And for James, who's doing AI, having access to that kind of, maybe more of a complete record set of what's going, a data set of what's going on, I think that improves the accuracy of the AI. But I think everyone's going to be concerned about the, uh, security and the participation. So you really need buy-in from a lot of parties to make something like that happen. Like I said, Darryl, I can't get labs, right? Yeah. I know we're out of time, but just one comment. Um, you know, when you, what, what, a lot of people are driving this, this centralized healthcare record. And, and the vision is that it's gonna solve, you know, a lot of our issues. 
But we actually have that for 50% of America. So when you look at Medicare and CMS, they have every single code for 50% of the United States, right? That already exists. And everyone is out to try to game the system. So they only send the codes that they want to send. They only give Medicare the vision that they want to give. And, and then you have a whole bunch of people trying to risk profile the whole population so they can go give Congress an estimate of how much money it's going to cost. And it, it actually has made things worse, not better. And so the only way it really works is if people are unafraid to put all their information into the centralized system. And that's obviously not the case with CMS, right, or, or Medicare. And so you start looking at what is a reasonable solution um, if to us eliminating, you know, the registration that we have at 10 different doctors being exactly the same. Um, the reality is, is, is I don't think there is one in the short term, but what we are seeing from a trend standpoint is Aetna CVS, right? Where CVS is now the point of care, Aetna is the provider. You have United Healthcare, Optum, these large vertically integrated systems, their goal is to do exactly that just within their system and then restrict you from going to any other doctor. And, and so, um, the, I, I, the real answer is, I don't know how it's going to be solved in the future. I see the trend that it's going. And the trend is these large integrated payers and then everybody else. And uh, we'll have to see if that's best for healthcare or not. Yeah. Well, listen, I know we had uh, one other question where we are out of time. I really appreciate uh, Kent and Greg and James, uh, you sharing your insights and wisdom and knowledge with this group. I think we could continue this discussion for a long, long time. Uh, but again, thanks to all and, and to the participants who asked great questions. Kim, I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to your questions specifically, but uh, thank you for joining this week's peers, uh, I'm sorry, this month's peers uh, group meeting. Uh, Joan, I'm gonna pivot back to you for any uh, concluding comments. Thank you so much, Daryl. And thank you to our panelists. I think this was an amazing conversation and one that needs to get to be continued because from every aspect of the value chain, we all need to work together to improve the experience for the patients and keep, get the costs out of healthcare. Thank you for joining us for AZ Bio Peers. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Again, a big thank you to Daryl as an amazing moderator and to Greg, James, and Kent for their perspectives on the intersection and convergence of healthcare and IT. See you next month.